All right. Born in Otago, moving to Tabanaki after having travelled the world through culturally diverse areas like Africa and Ngaroa Wahia, Karen has been gifted a worldview story foundation in fairness and unconditional love. With a very global view of society, both professionally and personally, we get a front row seat to the initiatives that Karen has been a part of. From being part of a school, it initiates two hours of priming before school starts, like exercise and meditation and a healthy breakfast and stuff before the bell actually rings and they get to learning, uh, on to ensuring that an important piece of her hometown is saved, a prominent member of the Save the Fitzroy Golf Club campaign. This lawyer is no stranger to campaigning for change as she joins the fight to changing legislation with an Aotearoa New Zealand which discriminates against Māori. She is definitely not your regular Karen. Ite iwi, it is my pleasure to bring to you this corridor with Karen Venimals, not your regular Karen. Easiest place, to, first question I kind of ask everyone, who are you, where are you from, where did you grow up and everything? So I'm Karen Venimals and I was born in Dunedin and um, we grew up on a fire station. Oh wow. Yeah, my dad was... Um, in the fire service, he was one of the um, officers in the fire service. And so we lived on station in a fire brigade flat. Cool. So backyard was a concrete um, playground. Well, it sounds cool, but we'll find out whether it really was oh, cool or not. It was, it was pretty cool. We had um, fire engines that were allowed to play on. Uh, we had a 60-foot tower that we were allowed to climb on until health and safety came in and then we... <laughs> Oh, they're always a buzzkill, those guys. Um, and so it was a bit, it wasn't like it wasn't like we didn't have grass. Uh, we did have, we could play games, you know, tennis and ball games on on the back wall, but um, we could play on foam when the fire, when the guys had finished a practice and had foam all over the place. Mm-hmm. And we used to play um, basketball and handball with the um, fireman, and so that was quite cool. Awesome. But it probably wasn't that cool for Dad because he never got away from work. You know, yeah, true. 20 minutes from the office to come home, and everything we did was watched by the fireman. So if we were naughty, <laughs> we, were, we were threatened by mum to always behave because dad didn't want the backlash of the, the bratty fire kids. So was it just you guys, or was it kind of like a little community of people? Or was it only your place no, that was there? No, there was a few families, there was about five families, okay. and there were a couple of families that had children the same age as us, and some older kids, and then there's some. Um, men who lived there that didn't have families, you know, they hadn't quite got to that yet. Yep. So, no, so it was pretty cool. And we were uh, really involved in sport. So we played heat sport, lots of swimming. Um, I played hockey. Um, and so we trained under Duncan Lang. I don't know if you know Duncan. I'm not going to pretend I do. No, I don't. He um, coached up Daniel Loder, who won two gold medals at the Olympics. Yeah, I know Daniel Loder. So, yeah, he was in our squad. He was just a bit younger than us. And um, so we trained 13 sessions a week, Two hours a day, uh, four hours a day, two sessions a day, um, ten thousand k a session. Far out. weights and calisthenics. Ooh. So. Um, Hope you're eating heaps. We yeah we we uh, we and we sleep, you know we're in bed by seven thirty mm. every night because we'd be at the pool at four thirty or five o'clock in the morning and. Wow. Just go straight from the pool to school, then go from school to the pool, then go home, have some food, and go to bed. Wow, so, yeah. so we, went, we well, well regimented. Yeah, that's right. And um, and I think Mum and Dad did it on purpose because then we couldn't get up to any mischief. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Well, there's no time for that when you're looking when you go by your schedule. Yeah, that's right. So um, so it was good and it was cool because we got to travel heaps and mm. um, in particular my brother was a really good swimmer so he competed at um, a really high level. I, I, I my the best I did was I got third in New Zealand. Cool. But um, my brother was was really good and. Um, and we played water polo, and both my brothers represented New Zealand. Oh. I made the New Zealand squad, but I didn't make the travelling team. <laughs> Missed my opportunity, yeah. So what, I'm going to ask like, straight away for me, obviously, the, the big thing that stands out for me when you're talking about this is discipline. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Was there ever like a time where any of you or your siblings kind of rebelled, like, nah, I'm not going to training today? And what, what was that dynamic like with mum and dad? Yeah. Uh, when we were younger, it was like, get out of bed. Um, and get up to the pool, but then I was like, if you don't want to go, that's your loss, you know, so we had to do it ourselves. And for as soon as my older brother got his driver's licence, it was up to us to motivate ourselves to get to training. Oh, yeah. So, um, if we didn't go, then... It was on you. Yeah. Because a lot of, um, I noticed that a lot of youth, and this is like speaking from personal experience, um, I'm still seeing it happen today, there's a lot of people... 
like a lot of young people, when they get to the age where like alcohol and the opposite sex come into play, a lot of their discipline or their training and stuff kind of goes out the window. Did you guys have those sort of yeah, hurdles when um, you were kids? And it was because swimming is so full on, like you, um, the parties were really tame. Yeah. Like, because even if people were drinking, they were home by 8.30 because they were so naked, you know, tired. And as they got older, yeah, there was a bit more behaviour. But um, not, we didn't really. And, we, and so when we were 14, I've got a twin brother, so when I say we, I'm yeah. talking about him, older brother and a twin brother and a younger sister, um, when we were 14, we shipped here. So Dad got a promotion and he became the area commander for the fire service here. So oh, okay. We shipped up here and then we got into surf club and um, kept swimming and, and did other things and then like got a bit more interesting and socially because yep. we weren't doing the super training because mm-hmm. the, the squad up here was doing um, about oh, 4k a session and so having come from 10k a session we are kind of like oh it's just the warm up this is easy <laughs> and so um so, that, so then we were able to get into other sports and do other things. I did wonder if it was the fiery stuff that brought you here or if it was the hockey, because the hockey, was, what was the hockey like here at the time? You've talked oh, about it. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, all right. Um, hockey was, I was, I was all right at hockey. I played for Otago when I was 12. Mm-hmm. That's my highlight. Yeah. Um, and then I just played for girls' high. I was just in the girls' high team here. But um, I'm the hockey coach at the moment, so hockey's quite... Uh, you know, just for the, my little girls team, but um, I'm not a hockey player really. Yeah. You know, just- I've played a couple of seasons, eh? Like, oh, so I moved back from Australia probably like four or five years ago. And when I first come back, one of my good mates at the time, she was like, hey, um, we need some more people come play. And I was just like, yeah, it'll be fun. I really, really enjoyed it. It's a cool sport <laughs> and it's hard. Because mm. especially on turf, it's so fast. So it's not, it's a really cool sport. And it's cool for kids because from day one, they can participate in the game. You know, sometimes with, like I've noticed with soccer, the good players get the ball all the time and the other kids mm. are sort of hanging around the sides. But the ball and hockey goes all over the place, so no one can really control it, especially when they're young. So every child gets to play, they pack it up real quick, and, and they end up having a really great, you know, fun season. I love watching, like, the... Um, like, it's, it's like when you watch the rugby games, I've seen it similar with, with hockey games with young kids. It's just all one big ball of kids yeah, right. running around this ball. You see them yeah. moving around, it's quite a crack up to yeah. watch. Yeah, so then when you come to New Plymouth, um, what was your first impression when you got here? Well, it's crazy because um, coming from Dunedin, we, um, a few things, we got burgled the first night we are here. Night number one. Night number one. We hadn't actually moved into the house yet. We are in staying at a motel and we are going to move into the house the next day. Oh my and gosh. the house got broken into. Where, what, like what area? <laughs> we, we were living in the fire service house, which is on the Ardit Street, just okay. two houses down from the park. Yeah. And, and that was... We put, I, know, I think we only got burgled one more time, but the cars used to get broken into all the time. Yeah. Just because of people walking up and down all the time. So we were like, oh my God, especially living in a fire station, we're so protected. We yeah, like true. Doors. That safety net was kind and of... The first night we were like, oh my God, what have, what have we shifted to? And then it was uh, fourth form, so year 10. So that was tough, moving sort of partway, halfway through the year, mm. making friends. So that was real, really tough. Um, Fruit trees, it was, things grew, you know, Dunedin's quite cold, so we didn't have, we couldn't grow, we had um, citrus trees on the front lawn, it was, that was unbelievable. Yep. And then the... Funny, um, eh, how the little things kind of stand mm, out and make a big difference? And one of the, one of the um, really interesting things is Dunedin is, um, was settled by um, Scots, you know, mostly Scottish people. Yep. The, the Pākehā settlers, and they... Um, named all the streets after Edinburgh, so all the streets were Scottish names. Mm. We shift up here and the streets are Māori names. So I had no idea. I remember one of the first days in school they made me read the notices and I didn't know how to pronounce Mangare. Mm. I had no idea. Like, didn't, and so I had to go, everyone, la, like, everyone was pronouncing it Mangare. Yeah, so I, they're getting it wrong still, so but they're making fun of you for getting yeah, it wrong. Even wronger. Yeah. <laughs> didn't even know where to start because we hadn't really, interestingly, hadn't really touched Māori. Mm. Because it was, you know, the, I guess the population of Māori in Dunedin is quite small. And, um, and I remember going to a marae down there and everyone looked like us. Like there, there wasn't a lot of difference in how we looked. And I, in Dunedin? Mm. Yeah. 
And then... Um, We're well, very different when you're into a marae here. Yeah. Well, I've just seen people around here. Yeah. You know, you know the... And, um, it's funny because I talk like when I think to um, my first experience going to Dunedin, <laughs> I remember this. I remember this like vividly. I went down to so there was a some sort of legislation change or something that happened. You'd probably know more about it than me. Where um, you weren't allowed to like stack your leave at work anymore or expired after a certain amount, something like that. So I had some leave at my job at the time that I had to use up. So my friends were all at uni, so they're like, "Oh, come down and spend some time down here." So I went down to Dunedin and had some time down there. And I remember seeing um, this one fella, he was probably, we were on Castle Street and he was probably, I don't know, like maybe 50 metres opposite side of the road. And he seen me and I seen him and he squinted his eyes and he looked at me and then he goes like this and did the eyebrow handshake and leaned back and, and I did it back to him and he come running across he's like where are you from he's like there's no brown faces down here and he was just so pumped to see me yeah. and I remember that being like I was thinking like wow, like you a good friend you need some mate mate so, yeah. and he was like so excited to see me where to go like, he turned out to be from Wanganui we knew some of the same people mm. so yeah, it was real funny but you know you're talking about when you're coming here and, mm. and a lot of things that surprised you mm. I kind of experienced the reverse when mm. I went down there mm. and I was surprised by what was surprising mm. and yeah so that's funny mm. yeah interesting yeah and it, and we um, it took me a little bit longer to love it here just because I left all my friends behind because mm. how old were you so 14, 14. yeah mm. so that's a that's a key that's a key yeah, yeah key age tough. but we joined um, Fitzroy Surf Club and we got really involved with swimming and surf club and we set up a water party team here and um you know, so the we were super busy, you know, really busy and loved it, you know, got made friends really easily. Cool. And um and mum and dad made lots of good friends too, it was awesome. So then um my nanny used to come visit us from Dunedin and she said, Well this is where I'm from. You know, this is where I was born. This is the house I grew up on on the And and you promise? Oh this is the only land that we used to own. This is been and so she Talk. But she lived in Dunedin. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So she had um, left here when she was eighteen because she was pregnant and she wasn't married. Ah, uh, yeah. And her mum and her, because um, great granddad had passed, um, left so that no one knew she was pregnant. I was actually having that conversation with a friend the other day. Like that was the thing, right? Mm. Like that's that used to happen a lot, or like. People would get sent away for work, mm. but they would go and have their kid, and then would get the farm night out or mm. given to another family or whatever, and then they would come back. Come back, right? I was just away working for nine months, months yeah. ten months, yeah, yeah. And so she tuned up in Dunedin, and then her mum brought the the baby up, is and it was brought up as her um, uncle, daughter, her uncle was a boy. Oh yeah. So, um, and then she got married and had my dad, and so that that son. And then his first son was he was brought up as his uncle, so but it was actually his brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is like more common than we'd probably think. Yeah, a lot of people might be going, "Wow!" But mm. check your own family tree; yeah, it's right. probably in there somewhere. Right. Yeah, and then she, um, so she knew quite a bit of history about about where we lived and where we came from, and um, and she talked a bit about how on the family land um, there was Māori wars. Yeah. And she's right. What she's talking about is the Battle of Wairaka out at Omata, and um, and I can't remember. I think that was about eighteen sixty, and um, and so it was. It just didn't feel real. Like it was just like this fairy tale because they've never heard anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then when I went to university at, back in Otago, they talked about it. They didn't talk about that particular bit of land, but they talked about it more. And so that was the first real formal experience of learning in the history of, of New Zealand or in terms of like land confiscation and stuff mm-hmm. like that oh okay yeah, yeah. so it's quite interesting so yeah. this was at uni so you were eight, 17, 18, 18 at the time yeah, yeah. yeah. and then um, so I went to uni to study law I've always wanted to be a lawyer since I can remember why? Um, I think it was because um, so I've got an old brother and I've got a twin brother and yeah, my old brother's two years older. And so you're always mitigating. <laughs> and I was all good till I got to about um, till I got to about twelve, and then they got stronger and faster. Than me. <laughs> and so then I had to get stronger and faster with my mum. Yeah. And so I was really uh, quite good at arguing. And so everyone always said, you know, you're good at arguing. You should be a lawyer. I think that's probably why. <laughs> but I also, the, why I really wanted to go was because I could see that there was some real inequity in the way women and men were treated mm-hmm. and um, I really wanted to go and help with that you know that was sort of my driver 